Hello, uh, my name is Shinichi Nakagawa, and I'd like to um, thank organizers who invited uh, me and also for organizing this uh, awesome conference online. Uh, today, I'd like to tell you about um, future meta-analysis from my perspective as evolutionary ecologist or evolutionary biologist. Okay, first, I'd like to acknowledge my lab members at the University of New South Wales, in Sydney, also uh, important co-authors and my colleague, uh, Will Conwell and Corey Callahan. Um, both were, used to be at um, UNSW, but um, Corey moved on to University of Florida as a new assistant professor. Okay, so first I'd like to tell you about um, meta-analysis beyond the literature-based data and give you a, like a really good example. And, um, you know, you may be thinking it's like a individual participant data meta-analysis, IPD meta-analysis. It's kind of close to that, but it's sort of like ideas goes beyond that. Okay. So citizen science is changing the way, um, you know, biologists correct uh, biodiversity data. And many probably ecologists and evolutionary bios have heard of GBIF. GBIF is the Global Diversity Information Facility. This is a meta uh, database, so database of databases. Um, it has lots of different nodes across the world and it's collecting millions of observations of um, uh, species data every day. And one of these nodes, database is eBird. And uh, for eBird, my kids are even contributing and probably among the listeners, there's many people contributing. This is not my kid, but you know, you can contribute this through, you can get mobile app, eBird mobile, mobile app, and you can put all the species you have seen per your uh, birding trip. Important thing is you can put time and how much you walked about, how many people participated, and also, most important, I want you to remember this is how many species you have seen and um, how many of individual species you have seen. Okay, so this is gonna be quite important bit later on. Uh, based on the citizen uh, data set, we actually estimated um, number of species, not the number of species, number of species, no, number of birds in the world. It turns out to be around 50 billion. So little shy of 10 birds per person in the whole world. And uh, yeah, done by Corey, me, myself, and uh, Will. And this is um, not only EBA data, but uh, some survey data uh, to estimate not only the number of birds, but the number of birds per species using some data uh, imputation method. Um, which is based on like how easy to detect color, flock size, and body size, and uh, conservation status. And we were able to estimate this. This is, this is pretty amazing to me. This was not possible uh, without citizen um, science data. But this is not quite meta-analysis, which as you know it, and this is a global data analysis. So I will tell you about meta-analysis example from my lab. And, um, but before I go to that, I need to tell you about the second law of macroecology. What it is, is abundance occupancy relationship. This is from Babak, uh, Babak et al's paper and the relationship is, so this is abundance, how many individual you've seen and how widespread the species are. So each data point is a species. So, idea of abundance occupancy relationship is widely distributed species are more abundant per unit space. And this, this is slightly counterintuitive or intuitive, I don't know, depending on, on a person, but uh, this has a conservation and a fishing corner, some applied um, implication. And uh, sometimes it's used because if species widespread, they are abundant per unit, so you don't need to worry about those species. Also, you can actually get more fish for that species, yeah? So that's an important relationship. 
And there's a reason why this is called the second law of macroecology because there has been a meta-analysis. This is the traditional uh, literature-based literature one. Uh, so they got um, nearly 300 effect sizes and the correlation was nearly 0 0.6. So ZI is a just a Fisher's transformation of um, correlation coefficient. This is a final plot. Um, you might be uh, used to seeing it like a 90 degree this way. But um, what you can see is that this is zero and all the data points that are sort of like, you know, most dense one is around like this 0 0.6. And uh, this was done by quite a few years ago by Blackburn et al. And um, that's that. That's why it's, a, it's a definitely by far the strongest relationship I've ever seen in ecology, it's by far, yes? This is why it's called a uh, second law. However, uh, if you read uh, related literature, there's a disregarded hypothesis. Uh, easiest explanation of this relationship, abundance occupancy relationship, is sampling bias. And a sampling bias hypothesis, even though disregarded or rejected in the literature, in the current literature, it states widely spread species are easiest to observe because it's uh, most. Um, widespread. So if you go around in the survey in the area, you see this first. But if you actually exhaustively um, observe that one area, this relationship would disappear. And also, maybe you know, the in the current literature, public published literature, there might be publication bias. So people go on a survey in an area, maybe they're only um, publishing a strong correlation. So overall, what we saw in the meta-analysis, this might be biased or like, you know, this 0 0.6 seems too high. So here comes our citizen uh, science data. How are we gonna uh, utilize that this citizen science data? Because there will be no publication bias if you use it all because people are not 10 citizens uh, collecting, you know, millions of people are doing it. EBIT, they are not concerned about, you know, whether this is significant or not. Okay, how do we do this? So each of these data points are checklist, and this millions of checklists here, and it's including nearly 8,000 species. And this is the example of three checklists in the US, Europe, and this is Australia. You can imagine that. So Corey goes out and birding, and he's, um, he saw uh, beetles, about 10 of them, that's a good day. And he observed about 30 different species and each of them, how many. And we can calculate correlation between local abundance, not the global abundance, but the range size, because range size, you can get estimate from GB for eBird, and we can correlate. So each checklist, which I talked about, we can get abundance information, occupancy relationship. I, we already know for these nearly 8,000 species. So each checklist, we can calculate correlation of this relationship, abundance occupancy relationship, and we can aggregate using meta-analysis. And this is called the final plot. I get explain this a bit later, more in the next slide actually. So it's a precision, so number of, in this case, species, higher number of species, you go and you put more effort, you get to the, this global mean. And we are expecting this to be like around zeta of 0 0.6 or above. If there's a publication bias happening, it will be smaller. So that's the meta-analysis we conducted. And I'll show you the uh, result. Results is look like this. It's a bang on zero. So that's, we were not expecting this at all because this is a second, Law of macroecology. We based this meta analysis on the effect size of the uh, nearly 17 million um, correlations. And this was based on the observation of 3 billion births, individual births. And the overall effect is almost zero, 0 0.015. Actually, it turns out to be because it's, we have a 17, nearly 17 million effect size, and this turns out to be significant, but I get to that point later. This is almost meaningless significance, yeah? But it's very close to zero. 
What's most surprising is uh, some of you are familiar with I square. I square is extremely small, and this is probably smallest. One of the smallest I've seen in ecological meta analysis because it's a mixture of different you know places, species. What it is, it's indicating is there's a vari lots of variation you see. Um, almost all variations um, uh, due to um, difference in sample size. And as you can see, so precision here, as precision increases, number of sample size increases. So those are like, you know, a couple of hundreds, hundreds of species observed. Those are, the, I think we excluded smallest ones. So I think you have to have about 12 species at least or something like this. And if you are observing just 12 species, this correlation, I expect it to vary due to the sampling, uh, sampling error, yeah? That's why meta-analysts include this sampling error variance explicitly to account for this. But what's surprising is almost all variation we see is due to the sample size. This actually really indicates this relationship must be close to zero. Um, despite this, the second law. And actually the original meta-analysis, Blackburn's meta-analysis conducted a fair number test to, they claim that uh, more than half million unpublished narratives would be required to nullify the effect of this magnitude correlation 0.6, but that's okay. We have, <laughs> we got it covered because we have a 17 million, not just a half million data set, um, sample size. It's interesting thing is you remember this sam sampling variance hypothesis, this is disregarded in the literature. However, so this is effort time, so the, Log one effort time is about three minutes. Log five is three hours. And as you can, uh, this is it's very hard to see. This is 17 million uh, data points. So if you are observing very little time, actually this effect appears a little bit, but it's completely goes to zero if you observe three hours. So actually this is a huge support for the sampling variance hypothesis, which nullifies the um, second law of, uh, law of uh, macroecology. So I'm wrapping up this part of the talk, future of meta-analysis, the data integration. So putting different data together. So we already know literature-based meta-analysis. Now that's lots of archived raw data. We're using raw data. This is the IPD meta-analysis, individual participant data analysis. But now we, use, we can use citizen science data. Also, you can actually you know, put together different type of um, data, such as climate data. And I quickly tell you the one example from our um, lab, and this is a study by uh, Sami Berg at our lab, and she collected, uh, this is the disease frequency. So the, you probably heard about the coral is affected by bleaching event. Um, not only breaching event, they are affected by different diseases. That's worrying. And she collected about 200 papers on the frequency of disease last, you know, several decades. And it shows um, it's the frequency is increasing. Yeah. But not only that, she, uh, she was able to collect Temperature data per these different studies, it comes from you know, all across different oceans. And you can, uh, she was able to also show temperature significantly correlates or predicts um, disease prevalence. So this is a percentage of disease. So, so this is what I call, uh, what I mean by data integration. So second part, big data and a meta-analysis. Um, Okay, so there's a couple of um, different um, parts to it, but those are a bit shorter than first part. Um, can I talk to my um, computer science colleagues? They think like, you know, all meta-analysis would be obsolete, you know, big data, we just kind of visualize, analyze big data um, directly. And uh, I actually personally disagree, and they also disagree with this view, Michael Chang and Susanna Jack, they're both meta-analysts. And what they propose is, so you have a big data here, 
But the, rather than analyzing it one go, you can uh, divide it into chunk. Maybe that has like, you know, data, big data heterogeneous. So you can split by places, split by year, split by different traits, or all sorts of things you can split by. Then you can actually calculate uh, effect size in each, you can meta-analyze, yeah? So this is a called split analyze meta-analyze approach. And we have certainly used this approach. And because of this approach, we were able to analyze big data. An example of big data we use is International Mass Phenotypic Consortium. You may not be familiar with this, but the, all data available online, and it has more than 500 trades. 100,000 mice of both males and females across 12 institutions um, across the globe. And using this data set and uh, the split analyze, meta-analyze method, we looked at the sexual dimorphism in not the mean traits, but the variability of the traits. So those distribution widths of the trait, whether there's a sexual dimorphism or sex differences, and it indicates certainly yes. Another one we use to this uh, split uh, analyze, meta-analyze method is we looked at sex difference aromatically. And in this particular uh, study I want to tell you about. And aromatry, what is aromatry? Aromatry, so let's say this is a female male. Um, this is exactly the same aromatric relationship. And it's a log linear usual relationship. Your body size increases, your eye size increases. Your body size increases. Uh, you don't move as much. Uh, this is a wheel, the running. So another one is this is actually aromatic relationship, it's different, but the mean traits overall mean the same. Um, male and female has a two groups. Ha groups have a different uh, aromatry, and this case means different, and slopes are different. And uh, there's a, another thing so we can measure. So differences mean, differences a slope, that's aromatry, and uh, difference in residual variability. So actually those means and variability are done in different studies. Those are the sexual dimorphism, relates to sexual dimorphism in the mean, those are variability. So that was a fast paper. So we are most interested in the slope differences. So we used uh, nearly 400 phenotypic traits for each we got um, effect sizes. This is a split bit, split by phenotypic traits. And we meta-analyzed per functional group. So we conducted nine meta-analysis using nearly 2 million uh, uh, data points from many mice. And this is what it looks like. And the most important is a slope one. This is a meta-analysis of the absolute differences in male and female and what you need to pay look at is if it's around zero, male and females are similar, but if it significantly deviate from zero, uh, these slopes are quite different. And you can see minology, it's a lot more different between male and female, also behavior. But uh, I'll explain, this is a bit hard to understand, explain the implication. So many cases, many traits, not all the traits, many traits, uh, slopes are different. So what does it mean? So this is a scenario, like this is the beautiful uh, pic, uh, you know, drawings done by Shimex Drobenyak. Uh, you saw him in the first, uh, second slide in acknowledgement. So male and female, exactly the same. And those three traits, you know, three traits among those many traits we looked at, fat tissue, retinal clearance rate, and metabolic rate, if they're exactly same size and on average, you can give the same uh, dose of drugs, that's no problem, but that's not true. Usually female mice are smaller and the people often, um, how do you say, assume it's a, you know perfect scaling there. So you can scale those three different traits as well. Uh, same rate as, you know, people assume the female small males. In such case, you can just give uh, two pills rather than three pills. But the, our studies, aromatic difference between sex indicates you can't do that. Body size, the same proportion scale, but the, those uh, different traits maybe relates to the drug metabolism scale differently between male and female slopes are different. In such case, if you just use male scaling slope, you might give two pills, that's an overdosing female, it's bad for female. But if you understand the female uh, specific slope, you'll be giving uh, right amount of pill. 
So this, you know, the giving um, overdosing or underdosing female happens in mice and humans because when they uh, test drugs, they're only using males or human male subjects. And we need to change this. Yeah. So big data meta-analysis, hopefully I convinced you this is really um, useful approach. And the last section I'd like to tell you about. Um, so last two sections were about, you know, we can use all sorts of different data, not confined to the literature-based data, but how we do meta-analysis are changing as well. Just a couple of examples. Um, this paper came from uh, Evidence Synthesis Hackathon, that is a predecessor of this conference, and uh, which I was involved um, in. And there, we talked about this new ecosystem for evidence synthesis. Currently, when we do uh, meta-analysis or evidence synthesis, there's empiricist and here's a synthesis. And uh, there may be different people, the same people, but what's happening in the uh, empiricist, some of them, they don't publish. So all I thought is not translated to the primary research. And we were only able to synthesize primary research and it leads to biased view of the evidence synthesis because we are synthesizing biased evidence base. Regardless, it's you know systematic map or you know meta-analysis or qualitative analysis. What we propose the future is not only just, you know, we should make the empiricist or synthesis involved, we should make a community of on a topic, all people working, because regardless of whether they publish or not, we can actually, because they are all part of the community, they can um, contribute to the all the synthesis, primary uh, uh, literature, regardless of their contributing, that we can synthesize all the effort. And this will lead to the unbiased evidence based. And uh, we should make it all open, open data, open code, and also you should use preference, then it's all open to the, the public and stakeholders. And the, finally, I quickly touch upon this hot topic. You know, the, I wrote blog to the our lab's uh, blog page, and uh, I use ChatGPT to see whether I can use this for the title and abstract, abstract screening, uh, not um, full text screening. But uh, one topic we were, I was able to get very, very good result, and I was really impressed. So I wrote this blog, but. Um, I think the next five years, use of AI and uh, in the evidence synthesis will increase uh, its presence. And um, I wouldn't be surprised in the sort of near future, it can do the all the screening and also all the extraction of moderator effect size might be difficult, but I could, we could be surprised. So all those things are changing and it's really um, exciting future is coming, I think. So take home messages from my talk is it's really bright future by combining different type of data, which um, I call the uh, data integration. And the meta analysis have a critical role to play in the era of big data. It's really data rich, um, data rich um, era with um, few or little theory. And uh, you know, you can use meta-analysis to generating theory. So you know, this will keep our us meta-analysis very busy. And um, so we talked about, you know, at the at toward the end, community-based synthesis AI will change the way we summarize the evidence base. You know, that that's pretty exciting. And finally, I, I looked like to thank meta-analysis, your audience, and the future matter. <laughs> I think everybody should do meta-analysis, the conclusion of this uh, talk. And thank you very much for listening.